Well, we continue today in our series, Where is God? A journey to the book of Esther. And we left off last week with Esther agreeing to go to the king at even the cost of possibly her own death. And today, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open and turn to Esther 5 and stand for the reading of God's most holy word. We'll be in Esther chapter 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, my wish and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And Haman went out that day, joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh, and Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she has prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. Would you pray with me? Now, Father, our prayer today is that you would open the scriptures to us, uh, that you would remove the scales from our eyes and the hardness of our heart that we uh, might receive the truth and and be changed by it through the preaching of the gospel. And we ask that you would uh, be with Pastor Trent as he recounts the study and the story that he has put in, and we pray that all this would be done to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Where is God? The question we continue to ask as we make our way through this series in the book of Esther. This week I was reading in the Naples Daily News and uh, I was reading the section where people write letters to the editor and I saw one particular letter that caught my eye and uh, I want to share it with you and the letter is written, it seems to me, in response to somebody else's letter or some article or something suggesting that God is somehow involved in politics, sports or something or the other like that. And this person is taking issue with that particular idea. This is what uh, the letter says, uh, selections of it. When did God become involved in politics? When did God become involved in sports, as many would have us believe when they point to the sky after scoring a touchdown? This is blasphemy, nothing less. Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. 
clearly indicating a separation of church and state. God does not get involved, this is key, God does not get involved in such worldly pursuits. God created us and left us to our own devices. Now, what, make, now, this, what makes the, the issue for the writer is that there is, uh, that all our attention is focused in the wrong place. That there is a devil, Satan, who is active and nobody's talking about him. This is what they go on to write. Satan is alive and well and is behind school shootings, shootings in Las Vegas, gangs, murders in Syria, and the World Trade Center bombings. Satan is alive and well and kicking God in the... If God were as all-powerful as most think, then good would be winning over evil. But it is not. God needs our help in this battle. I, say, I share this with you not to make any kind of a mockery of this particular view, but I want us to think about what's being said here. If we, th- by the way, I don't think this is a non-Christian writing. This, I think this is a person who ostensibly is presenting what they believe the Bible teaches. This is a, for them a, a Christian theology. And what it's saying, we can break it down into three parts. First of all, God has created us and left us to our own devices, and he is not interested in the events that are happening in this world that he may. That's the first thing. Secondly, Satan is very much real and active, and he cares a great deal about what's happening in this world. And in the battle of good versus evil, Satan is winning. And we might then infer that God presumably doesn't care because he's not interested in what's happening in this world anyway. But then thirdly, Thirdly, unless humanity comes to the rescue, God's toast. He's finished. Unless humanity comes to the rescue, gets its act together, God will fall at the feet of Satan and lose this great cosmic battle that rages that God's not particularly interested in anyway because he's not paying attention really to the things that are happening in this world. He's created us, set us in motion, took his hands off. This, brothers and sisters, is why we want you to read your Bible. When we say we're committed to the Word, we don't just mean that we think it's a good idea and that people should read it. We think you should read it. You need to know what it says. This is why we're reading through the Bible in a year because there are people who are presenting ideas like these ostensibly as Christian theology and you need to know how to answer these things. Now, here's the thing about this particular set of statements. One doesn't need to be a Christian. One doesn't have to believe what the Bible says. One just simply has to be an intellectually honest person to read the Bible and say, you know, I may not believe it, but I know that's not what it says. If we simply know what's in there, we know that's not what it says, whether we believe it or not. And so what we want to do is look at at this view, which is obviously held by somebody out there, and maybe variations of it are held by multiple people, about what exactly is the relationship between God and Satan and this world and the things that are taking place in it. Now, if you did not have the scriptures available to you, it would be understandable how a person could observe the world and come to the conclusions that this person has come to. We could look around the world and say that evil is is winning. For it is everywhere present. It does seem that evil continues to be on the rise, that that good seems to be trumped by evil all over the place. Even for people of faith, it's very easy for us to look around the world and join in asking the question, where is God when wicked people plot? Why does he allow school shootings to go forward? People are premeditating these plans. They're dreaming up these things for years sometimes. Where is God when the wicked are plotting? Is he just simply getting outdone? Does he not have the power to, to put a stop to it? Is he, are his hands bound by some concept of free will? Is God powerless to stop these things? Where is God when, when nations are making wicked schemes to wipe out races and people off the face of the earth? Where is God when wicked people plot? However we get there, through whichever door, this is a question a lot of us find ourselves asking at different times in our lives and Certainly, as we observe the world around us, it's a question we hear come up quite frequently. So how might we answer this question? Well, the book of Esther answers this question 
continually. I mean, the whole story is an answer to the question of where is God? And the beautiful thing about it, as we've seen, is it shows us where God is all over the place without ever mentioning him a single time. But this particular chapter that we're looking at today answers the question, where is God? In a uniquely powerful kind of a way. If you remember the story so far, we saw that Esther has risen to power in, in Persia. She's now the queen. She went from being a, a Jewish orphan to being the queen of Persia and now secretly a Jew in the kingdom. Meanwhile, her uncle Mordecai has offended the king. Sorry, not the king, but the king's second in command, a man named Haman. Haman is an enemy of God's people. After he's offended by Mordecai the Jew, he decides that not only will Mordecai die, but he's going to kill all the people of God. And so he puts into motion a plan, and a decree goes out that on the 12th, in the 12th month of the year, on one day, all of the Jews are going to be destroyed. Mordecai comes to Esther, pleads with her to use her position and her power to intercede on behalf of the people and to ask the king to reverse somehow the decision to save them. Esther, as we saw last week, is hesitant to do this because risking exposing her identity means she will lose the safety of the palace, the pro all the promises of the palace, wealth, status, and not only that, but actually to expose her identity as a Jew potentially means she will also lose her life along with her people. So for all of these reasons, she's not interested in risking. But Mordecai convinces her, and we left off last week with the decision she finally made that she was going to go forward, and she says, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to come out and I'm going to ask the king for mercy on behalf of my people. So this is where we pick up our story. And the first heading I want us to address this under is, is this, that God is on the move, though we don't always see him. Where is God when wicked people plot? God is on the move, though we don't always see him. From the beginning of this story, from the beginning of this series, we said each and every week that God is omnipotently present even where he is most conspicuously absent. He is omnipotently, all-powerfully present, even in those places where it seems he is not at all. So we're reaffirming that this morning. He's, he's working, he's moving. Uh, we don't... The beauty of the book of Esther, though, is that it's written to us in the way that we largely experience life. Meaning... Like Esther, we don't get a particular word or revelation from God that he's doing something. We instead just find ourselves in places that feel like risk where we have to make decisions and we have to move forward and hope and trust that God is on the move. So Esther helps us capture this. Well, where do we see, and, and it's written in such a way that we would be looking for God all throughout the book, that we'd be searching for him. And that's the way in which we live our lives as believers. We're looking for him at work all over. And oftentimes we don't see him in the moment, but with the benefit of hindsight, we can see the evidence of his working all along the way. And such is the case in our story today. So where do we see God on the move in this story? First of all, we see that God is on the move and that it is him who puts Esther into motion. God puts Esther into motion. So we read in chapter 5, verse 1, if you, if you have your Bible, it says, on the third day, remember we left off, she told all the people to fast for three days, and it says, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarter while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. So she has stepped forward into motion. She's put on her royal robes. She's decided, I'm going to approach the king. She said, if I perish, I perish. And here in this verse we read, on the third day of the fast, she steps across that line from which there is no return. This step demonstrates the sincerity of the faith that Esther has already expressed. By taking this step, she's declaring that her trust and her hope are ultimately in God alone. Because what she deserves for taking this step into the king's presence, uninvited, is death. That's the penalty. That's what she's up against by taking this step. But when she said, if I perish, I perish, she's already been set free from those shackles that formerly held her. 
the, the promises of the palace of wealth and power and status and, and even her life itself. She's now free of those things and she steps forward. Likewise, brothers and sisters, when we answer Jesus' call to take up our cross and follow him, we too are set free from the promises that this world has to offer. And we are able for the first time to hear and obey Jesus no matter the call because we've already said we've died with him. It is God who puts Esther into motion and it is God who puts you into motion. When you take up that cross and you follow Jesus, it's because of God's grace at work in your life. And so it is in the story of Esther. It's God who puts her into motion. So she steps into the presence of the king and we're waiting here in the story to find out, is she going to get what she deserves that is sure and certain death? Well, what we read next is that God is at work and it's God who gives Esther favor with the king. Verse 2. And when the king saw Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even to the half of my kingdom. We don't know what was going on in the king's mind that day. We don't know what was happening in the court or in the kingdom. But whatever the case, when Esther steps in and he sees her and he realizes what's happening, she wins grace. She wins favor in his eyes. It's actually the same word used to describe her in chapter 2, verse 17, when she appears before him for her one night audition, and the scripture says that she won favor in the eyes of the king. It is God who's at work orchestrating these events such that she finds favor in his eyes. Now, we are reading here in our Bible the translation of the Hebrew text of Esther. There's another early translation in Greek that's contained in what's called the Septuagint. Some of you are familiar with this. And the Septuagint is another early translation of, of the scriptures, and it contains an extended version of this story that may or may not be historical, but it's certainly more dramatic, and it adds a little bit more color to this throne room scene. And I share it with you as a, as a, as a possible deeper look into what is happening here in this particular Place. So this is how the Septuagint records this section of Esther. It says, having passed through door after door, she found herself in the presence of the king. He was seated on the royal throne, dressed in all his robes of state, glittering with gold and precious stones, a formidable sight. Raising his face, a fire with majesty, he looked on her, blazing with anger. The queen sank down. She grew faint, and the collar drained from her face, and she leaned her head against the maid who accompanied her. But God changed the king's heart, inducing a milder spirit. He sprang from his throne in alarm and took her in his arms until she recovered, comforting her with soothing words. Maybe that's how it went down. But whether explicitly attributed to God, as the Septuagint does, or implicitly as our Hebrew text does, we know that it is God who's at work in the heart of the king that is giving him a favorable disposition towards this woman who, according to law, deserves only death. When did God get involved in politics? Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. From the beginning, God has been involved in politics. He's been working in the hearts of leaders and world rulers and, and others in positions of power and authority. From the beginning, there is no politics in which God is not involved. He's ruling all things, ultimately, for his glory and for the good of his people. And he's working here in the heart of the pagan king Ahasuerus to accomplish his good purposes for his people. Now, before we pass on from this section, let me just say, uh, we can't pass over this without seeing something. For those of us who believe and who've trusted in Jesus, there's something we can't pass over without commenting on, even though it's not the point. It's not the main point, certainly, of this section. But we see here in this passage a picture of our own salvation. You have the king sitting on the throne in all of his robed and royal majesty. 
But unlike King Ahasuerus, the king of glory actually sits on a throne of righteousness and justice. He is perfect in all of his perfections. And for us to enter into his presence in all of his glory and his holiness, the scripture says, means sure and certain death for us. It's exactly what we deserve because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And yet... The scripture says that for those who've put their trust in Jesus Christ, you can enter into the king of glory's presence, not dressed in your own robes of righteousness, which are just filthy, dirty rags, but dressed in the righteousness of Christ. And when you enter God's presence on that last day, dressed in the righteousness of Christ, you don't have to wonder how the God will receive you, but you can have confidence that when you see him dressed in Christ's righteousness, that he will extend to you the scepter of mercy and that you will reach forth and take hold of his mercy, receiving that which you do not deserve. But not only that, but for those who've trusted in Christ, when you meet the king of glory, and he extends that scepter to you. He's not only offering you pardon, but he's also in mercy, but he's giving you grace. He gives you what you don't deserve. As the king says to Esther, ask me whatever you wish up to half my kingdom and I'll give it to you. So the king of glory says to us who deserve only death, ask me whatever you wish in the name of Jesus in whose name you come and I will give it to you. And whereas King Ahasuerus says, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom, and he only means it figuratively, it was a way of speaking for kings. Our king says, I'll give you the kingdom. And you'll reign with me, and you'll rule with me forever. Isn't that good? If you haven't trusted in Jesus, then when you stand before the king, your only expectation should be sure and certain eternal death. But if you've put your trust in him, you can be sure when you stand before God, you'll receive pardon, mercy, and grace upon grace, and you will share with him and reign with him forever in glory. That's good news. God's grace for us. Even here in Esther, we see a picture. So God's at work. He's, he's giving Esther favor, but we also see God at work in that he gives her wisdom. He gives her wisdom to approach the king. Um, as you look at, at the passage, we see that she says to the king after giving this thing, she says in, in verse 4, And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman come to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What's your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom... And it shall be fulfilled. So the king is offered. She asked him to come to the feast. They have the feast. Just three people. Kind of an odd feast. But they had the feast. And afterwards, the drinking. And he says, so what do you want? What's the, what caused you to put your life on the line to come and seek me out? And we're expecting that she's going to say, I'm a Jew. And you've just signed an order that all the Jews should be killed. But she doesn't say that. Look what it says in the next verse. Then Esther answered, verse 7, My wish and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. It seems like Esther's getting cold feet here. He's just opened the door wide open. Two times now he has said to her, Ask whatever you want and I'll do it for you. And when she has the opportunity, she says, You know what? I'm going to have another feast tomorrow. Come to that, and then I'll tell you. It seems like she's getting cold feet. And it might be that that's what has happened. But more likely, Esther is exercising great wisdom here in how she approaches this king. Two times now, she's gotten him to the place where he has said, ask whatever you wish, and I will do it for her. Before she actually asks him for what she wants, she will have him have said three times publicly, ask me whatever you want and I will do it for you. She's putting him in a position that he cannot refuse what she says without losing great face. And what we know about kings is that they don't like to lose face. You might remember the story of another king named Herod who had a young lady dance for him and he was so pleased. He said, ask whatever you want up to half the kingdom and I'll give it to you. And that 
young lady at the advice of her mother said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And it says that Herod, for fear of losing face, couldn't refuse. So here Esther seems to be using a similar approach with the king, but not for wicked purposes, but for good purposes. And she's putting him in a position that ultimately, it seems, he can't refuse. God is on the move in this story, though we don't always see him. Now, when people, when we live in this world and we go through life in this world, lots of folks say, and sometimes we might even buy into believing, that there is no rhyme, there is no reason, that everything that happens in this world is a product of time and chance. That there is no overall purpose, there is no order, there's no goal, there's no aim. It's every man for himself. And when you read the wisdom literature, if you're following along in our Bible reading plan, you're reading through Proverbs and you read through Ecclesiastes, the scriptures acknowledge how life looks when we're living in the midst of it. It does sometimes look like the wicked prosper and that there will be no justice and that, and that uh, living righteously doesn't have any ultimate purpose or end. But with the eyes of faith and with the testimony of scripture, we know that that there is a God who sits on the throne and he's on the move, though we don't always see him. All right, well, as we continue through the story, we see that God is not the only one on the move, but secondly, we see that Satan is on the move, though we don't always see him. Now, let me first of all acknowledge to you that Satan is not mentioned in this text. But just like God is not mentioned in this text, it doesn't mean he's not there. And what the scripture teaches us to understand very much clearly in the New Testament is that behind the seen powers of this world are unseen powers that are at work. Now there are lots of people who don't believe in a real personal devil and a real, a real Satan, a real personification of evil in, a, in the form of an actual spiritual being called Satan or, or, or the devil. And I don't have time to make a case for that at the moment. It's simply enough if you are a Christian to know that Jesus clearly believed in a real and personal devil. And for us who call him Master and Lord, that is enough. The apostles likewise clearly believe in a real personification of evil known as the devil, and that along with him there are all kinds of powers and rulers and authorities, spiritual forces of darkness at work in our world. And so they are present, and they're present here in this text. Now where do we see Satan on the move in this story? Well, again, we see him at work in plenty of ways, and I suspect that we see him working in two ways in particular. First of all, it seems to me that Satan is, on the, is working, he's utilizing Haman's idolatry. He utilizes Haman's idolatry. So the story shifts here, moves away from the focus on Esther and the king, and it begins to focus on Haman, Mordecai, and his groupies. And here's what we read, verse 9. They're leaving the feast, and it says, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. So Haman is on the top of the world. He just left this feast. He's the only guy in the entire kingdom invited to feast with the king and the queen. And he's got invited back tomorrow. So he's walking down the street, He's singing, you know, I see trees of green, red roses too. He, I mean, he is great. He's clicking his heels, and then he sees him. If you watch Seinfeld, you know it's like Newman. <laughs> the arch enemy. For him, it's Mordecai. I hate that guy. I, just to see him makes me sick. I can't, oh, I can't stand him. And Mordecai is essentially, he's thumbing his nose at Haman. He's, he's continuing to not stand for him. He's continuing to not to do the things that have set Haman in motion to want to kill him in the first place. And Haman, he just wants to wring his neck. But he restrains himself because Haman didn't get where he got by being a man who doesn't have at least some strategy. And so we read how he responds in verse 10. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, 
the number of his sons, all the promotions with the king with which the king had honored him and how he'd advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. And then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I'm invited by her together with the king. So his ego is deeply wounded again by this guy, Mordecai. And what does he do to console himself? He does what we do when our egos are bruised. He begins to rehearse his glory to other people. He begins to rehearse for others just how great he is. Who does this guy think he is? Doesn't he know who I am? Doesn't he know what I've done? Doesn't he know who my people are? Doesn't he know how I've advanced? Doesn't he? I am better than this. He consoles himself. He gets his people together and they have to sit and listen to, yeah, I know, you're better than this. You don't deserve this. Yeah, you did that, right? <laughs> Which is, by the way, how it sounds to other people when we do that. <laughs> He's rehearsing his own greatness. And it comforts him for only a moment. But what we realize is it, not ultimately, it doesn't ultimately solve the deeper problem in his heart. See, here's the thing. If you get your sense of worth from people, then your sense of worth can also be taken by people. If you get your sense of worth because other people think you're great, then when other people don't think you're great, you lose your sense of worth. Likewise, if you get your sense of worth from your wealth, your sense of worth can also be lost along with your wealth. And wherever you get your sense of worth from that is finite and losable, if that's what you're pinning your value on and your worth in life and your meaning and your joy and your hope... Let me just tell you, it's fragile, and you'll probably lose it, and you'll lose yourself. And some of you have experienced that in your life in some hard ways. This too, though, I would say, is God's grace to us. See, Haman puts his finger right on it when he says in verse 13, I'm all this, I'm, I've done all these things, I've had all this greatness, yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Wealth, power, honor, prestige, all of it doesn't mean anything to me so long as that guy is there. Can you believe that? Do you see how fragile that is? That, that one measly Jew can take from him everything he's worked his whole life to accomplish and to achieve? Do you want to build your life on something like that? One commentator writes, what Haman craved above all things was not simply significance, but rather to be seen significant. He didn't so much matter to him that he was significant, but what was so important to Haman was that he be seen as somebody significant. And Mordecai refused to give him what he most wanted in all the world. This is his idol. And unless you're worshiping the true God, unless he's first in your life, there is something out there like that for you as well. That unless you have that one thing, everything else is meaningless and worthless to you. You can't be happy unless you have it. You might identify it by filling in the blank. This statement that, that, Mordecai, uh, that, that Haman says, he says, yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as. How do you fill in that blank? What's the thing that makes everything else worthless unless you have it? That's your idol. That's the thing that owns you. That's the thing that you'll break rules to get. That's the thing that you'll hurt other people. You'll sacrifice your family and the people you care about to have it. That's the thing that you'll hurt yourself and ruin your life to get. We can see it most clearly with, with people who are addicted to drugs. It's very easy to see that and to watch how, how, how they can have everything, but unless they have that fix, everything else is worthless. So they'll hurt their family, they'll hurt themselves, they'll, they'll throw it all away in order to get that thing. We can see that so clearly, but, but don't you see idolatry works the same way? The only difference is nobody will throw you in jail if you destroy your family pursuing your career. But it's just as destructive. And so, dads, to you, when Haman ultimately ruins his life because of his idol of being seen to be significant, it doesn't just affect Haman, it affects his whole family. 
And dads, God says you're the head of your households. You may not believe it. Your family may not believe it. But God sees you that way. And you're called to see yourself that way. And you need to know that whatever it is that, that you're building your life upon, it's not only going to ruin you, but it will affect your children, your spouse. And the way out of this idolatry is not just to try to stop worshiping everything and making all of the things of life ultimate things. The only way out of this is to, is to put God in his right place in your life. Amen. To see him as first. And then other things can take their place. And while you may have disappointments and hardships along the way, when you lose these things, it doesn't make everything else meaningless because those things still have their proper value in relationship to the ultimate thing in your life, which is God himself. See, the Christian is the one who says, everything else in this world is meaningless to me unless I have Christ. That's, that's the thing. He's the one. I can lose everything else, but, unless, but if I have him, everything else I can go without. All right, Satan, Satan provides and he capitalizes on Haman's idolatry. And we see, secondly, that at this moment, Satan also provides wicked counselors for Haman. We read in verse 14, Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows, 50 cubits high, be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So perhaps just to get him to stop talking about it, they say, you know what? If, they, if you're such a big deal in the kingdom and this Mordecai is such a problem for you, then why don't you construct a giant gallows 75 feet high and hang the guy on it? Kill him. You don't have to. You're the number two person in the kingdom. You don't have to do this. You don't have to put up with this. Just kill the guy. And he says, you're right. The 75 foot high gallows is the perfect picture of Haman's ego. On display, and his aim is to make Mordecai an example. Now, here's the next cliffhanger Esther is prepared to tell the king tomorrow at the feast that she's a Jew and to save the people, but Haman has just put in place a plan to kill Mordecai in the morning, and Esther doesn't know anything about it. And so while she may save her people, she's going to lose her uncle and it will seem maybe that all of this has not been worth it. We see that it's going to take more than humanity simply being involved here. If good is going to prevail over evil, it's going to take a rescue from God and, and we're not going to, well, I don't want to give it away, but let me just tell you this. Psalm 37 says, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. Where is God when the wicked plot? He sits in the heavens and laughs because he knows that the day is coming for the wicked. And we'll see that played out. So our friend who writes the letter to the editor is right. Satan is on the move. He is real. He is personal. He's active. He's working in this world. The scripture says that Satan came to steal, to kill, and destroy. It says that he's the father of lies. Anywhere we see stealing and killing and destroying and deceitfulness and lying, and we know that Satan is at work. Where he gets it wrong is that Satan somehow has power over God. Or that he even has power over God's people. You see, the apostle Paul recognizes the reality of the spiritual forces that are at work in the world. And he does not tell us to fear them, but rather he says to be on guard. To know that he's scheming, that, that, that the wicked plot because Satan is a plotter. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, he warns them about making sure to keep short accounts and forgive so that we would not be outwitted by Satan for we're not ignorant of his designs. He says later about the importance of dealing with anger and not letting it linger in your life. Why? Because, he says in 427, give no opportunity to the devil. If we're allowing unforgiveness, if we're allowing anger to, 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 to remain in our lives and heart, we're not dealing with them. We're, we're ignorant of Satan's schemes and how he uses those things to destroy people, relationships. 
Paul says in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan is on the move, though we don't always see him, and we must not be ignorant of his schemes and his devices. We are not to fear him, but we're to live in obedience to Christ, to submit ourselves to what the scripture says, to go on believing and proclaiming the gospel, and to make sure that our battles are not purely human battles, but that we're engaging in the spiritual battle, prayer, the truth of the word, the shield of faith, and so on. So, Satan is on the move, God's on the move. The third thing, though, we see is that Satan's moves must accomplish God's ends, and everyone will see it. We may not see God on the move, but he's moving. We may not see Satan on the move, but he's moving. Here's what we know. All of Satan's moves must ultimately accomplish God's ends, and when it happens, everyone will see it. Everyone will see it. As you read through the scriptures... You see Satan at work in the lives of people. And one person that he's at work in is named Judas. And the scripture explicitly says that Satan entered into Judas on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Satan's on the move. He's scheming. He's utilizing the idolatry of the man Judas in order to put an end to the Christ. And Satan brings his worst on that first Good Friday. His scheme seems to have worked. The religious leaders have orchestrated a plan so that the Roman soldiers would crucify Christ, and they do. And yet, even in this most wicked and evil of schemes, Satan's, his aims and his moves must ultimately accomplish God's ends. And that's exactly what happens. Colossians 2 puts it this way. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses, how does he do that? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. In other words, the reason why you could be brought from death to life is that God has canceled your sins, which required death. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Satan names to have Christ crucified. He does so, but what he does not realize or doesn't appear to be uh, cognizant of is that in so doing, he has lost the one weapon he had to use against God's people, and that is our guilt, our sin, our shame. (coughs) Through the death of Christ, Christ has taken away our sin. He's paid the debt that we owed which means Satan no longer has any ammunition with which to come after us. Satan is unwittingly, he's not the rival of God, he's not the equal of God, he is unwittingly God's servant. And he can only do what will ultimately accomplish God's glory and the good of God's people. You need to remember that about him. And to fight the fight with prayer, with the word of truth. And remember, when wicked people plot, God is there. He's on the move. He's working, though you might not see him. Satan's on the move as well, though you might not see him. But you can have confidence in this, that all of Satan's best moves can only accomplish God's good ends for your good in God's glory. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in your sovereignty and that we don't have a God who's pleading for help from humanity. That we don't have a God who can ever be defeated, but who already through his death has dealt the death blow to the enemy, through his resurrection has has already dealt the death blow to death, and in your coming will bring that victory to its final consummation. We rejoice in these truths and in this hope and we pray that you would help us to live in it and to be a people who do not fear when the wicked plot but who continue trusting in you, faithfully doing what is right day after day and knowing that you have the victory. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.